Hi friends, I'm Father Kerry Walters, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on a 12th century theory of ethics that I think still has a lot of relevance for us today, 800 years later. The theory of ethics that I'm talking about was defended by Abelard, a philosopher and theologian who died in the year 1142. You may be familiar with Abelard's name because you might know something about the uh, almost legendary at this point tragic romance between Abelard and one of his students, the maiden Eloise. But what you may not know is that Abelard uh, possessed one of the finest minds of his generation, as did, by the way, Eloise, who hasn't at all received the recognition that she so rightly deserves. Abelard was a man of faith, but he was also a student of Aristotle's logic, and he was known as the best teacher of logic or dialectic, as it was frequently called in his day, uh, going in Europe at the time. Abelard insisted that faith is important and should never be trivialized, much less dismissed, but that faith goes hand in hand with reason's ability to logically analyze our beliefs about God and our relationship with God in order to untangle the truthful from the exaggerated or the downright false. So for Abelard, reason and faith go hand in hand. They complement one another. Both are necessary for Christians who really want to live their faith as fully and as reasonably as they can. Now, Abelard applied his high regard for reason to any number of theological and philosophical fields, and one of them is ethics. In two books, neither of which, unfortunately, he ever managed to complete, Abelard outlines for us a theory of morality that is still well worth considering. The two treatises that I'm talking about are simply entitled Ethics or Know Thyself on the one hand, and a dialogue between a Jew, a Christian, and a philosopher on the other. And even though they're not completed, we can glean enough of Abelard's ethical thought to figure out what the broad structure is. So, what Abelard wants to do is to find the locus of good and evil. He wants to find out where moral goodness and moral wickedness or sinfulness reside. What's the origin of them? And he considers three different candidates, actions themselves, desires or motivations, and intentions. And in his work, he's going to scrutinize each one of these candidates from a rational perspective to see if, in point of fact, any of them really do serve as the origin of moral goodness and moral wickedness. So take actions first. Both in his day and in ours, many people do think that the moral caliber of an individual is determined by his or her actions, and that the moral caliber of the actions is determined in turn by the objective consequences to which the actions give rise. That's a common way of thinking. And it's not entirely wrong because, of course, actions are important in the moral life. But Abelard doesn't think that actions are the origin of moral goodness and moral wickedness, even though they are clearly implicated in the moral life. And the reason for that, according to uh, Abelard, is that actions are typically morally indifferent or morally neutral. They can be interpreted uh, in any number of ways. He uses an example, it seems to me, that is quite telling. He says, consider the following case. Two wealthy guys decide both with noble intentions to build almshouses or places where the indigent poor can go to um, receive food and shelter and, and medical assistance. One of these two wealthy guys actually builds his almshouse, and the consequence is good for a lot of poor people. The other uh, wealthy guy, through no fault of his own, loses his fortune and so is unable to build the almshouse that he wanted to build. Now, both of these guys took vows to build almshouses. One of them fulfilled his vow. One of them broke his vow. We would have to say if actions were the primary uh, origin of moral goodness and moral wickedness, that the first guy is morally good because he fulfilled his vow, 
But the second guy is morally wicked because he broke his vow. And yet there's something absolutely strange about that kind of conclusion because the second guy didn't deliberately break his vow. It's hard to say he broke his vow at all. He wasn't the agent of breakage. His ill fortune in losing his money was the agent that broke the vow, if we can put it that way. So Abelard thinks that actions in and of themselves aren't reliable candidates for determining where moral goodness and moral wickedness originate. What about then desires or motivations, as psychologists might say today? They too have been viable candidates for the locus of moral goodness and moral wickedness. That is, morality consists in reveling in good desires and sinfulness consists in reveling in unworthy desires. Well, that might sound reasonable too, but in point of fact, there are at least two problems with that, says Abelard. And the first is this. Uh, desires arise within us spontaneously. They're not something over which we have a lot of control, if any control at all. Uh, a typical desire, for example, is lust. Lust simply arises in human beings uncalled for, untoward. Uh, it's not something that we can control. Uh, the desire in and of itself is simply spontaneous. That's the first problem. How in the world can you say that something which is spontaneous and uncontrolled serves as the origin of moral goodness or moral wickedness? And the second problem is this. Sometimes we can fall into actions which objectively are evil, not because we revel in evil, but for some other reason. And here's another example from Abelard. He's wonderful with his examples. He says, consider this case. A monk who has taken a vow of chastity is chained to a bed and is surrounded by affectionate women. Um, in the process, uh, he breaks his vow of chastity, even though he has no desire to do so. He's fighting with everything that he has against consummating the desire, but the desire arises in him spontaneously because of the situation in which he finds himself. Are we really going to say that he somehow is immoral because the vow was broken, even though he did not revel in the desire that seems to be the immediate cause of the breakage of the vow? That, too, seems to be counterintuitive, according to Abelard. So desire doesn't seem to be a reasonable candidate to serve as either the locus of moral goodness or moral wickedness. And that leaves us with intentions. What is our intention when it comes to any specific act in the world or when it comes to responding to any of these spontaneous desires that simply arise in us. For Abelard, intention, consent or refusal to consent, is the key to understanding moral goodness and moral wickedness. Intention, the, desire, uh, the consent or the refusal to consent to either a desire or an action, that's the origin, that's the locus of moral goodness. So, of course, for example, lust will arise in me. Um, the morality of how I respond to that lust, over which I may have no control from a psychological and biological perspective, lies in whether I consent to act upon it or refuse to act upon it. Or take the two wealthy guys who were going to build almshouses. The intention in both is noble. They both consent to do something that is noble. And in so far as they do that, they are acting morally, even if one of them is unable to follow through with the intention. So for Abelard, then, ethics is based, ethical goodness, the origin of morality and the origin of wickedness, is based not on actions and not on desires, but on intentions or consent to desires or intentions or consent to do this kind of action as opposed to that kind of action. That leaves us with a couple of questions that Abelard addresses, but really doesn't have the time that he needs to address in a fully satisfactory way. The first is this, 
What do you do with actions, regardless of their intentions, that seem to really create a situation which is unsalutary, as an example for everyone else? Here's another case study that Abelard presents us with. A young mother has worked all day. She is exhausted. Her child is crying nonstop. So she uh, puts the child in bed with her in the hopes that the child will calm down. The mother, in her state of exhaustion, falls heavily asleep. She rolls over on the child, and she smothers the child to death. What should be done in that case? There's no ill intent there on the mother's part to harm the child. Quite the contrary, as a matter of fact, there's no desire to harm the child, but the action is a, harm, a harming of the child. How should society respond? What would be the right thing to do from a social perspective? Well, Abelard says something rather surprising, perhaps, at this point. He says that in order to keep the body politic together, in order to satisfy uh, society's uh, hunger for justice, the mother should be blamed for the child's death. Otherwise, we set an example that simply isn't conducive to the flourishing of society. So we have a curious case here, don't we? From a moral perspective, the mother is innocent, but from a legal perspective, she's guilty and should be punished accordingly. That's the first rather strange conclusion that Abelard arrives at uh, when discussing the relationship between intention and social norms and mores. And the second strange conclusion, or perhaps it's not so strange, uh, but the second surprising conclusion, perhaps, that he arrives at is this. In response to the question, how do we tell if an intention is good or bad? His response is, well, we know that it's good or bad if it's in conformity or if it's in rebellion against the will of God. It's just as simple as that, says Abelard. Our intentions are noble and good and trustworthy if they accord with what our conscience and our reason tells us is the will of God. Our intentions are unworthy in direct proportion to how they rebel against the will of God as revealed to us by faith and reason. Abelard didn't have time to fully explore this second claim, but, you know, my guess is that he felt he really didn't need to explore it all that thoroughly, because I believe Abelard would have said, we know a great deal about the will of God from Scripture and from church teaching. So if we simply pay attention to that, using once again both our faith and our reason, uh, a well-informed conscience, uh, then we will be able to muster the right consent or refusal to consent when it comes to intentions. It's an intriguing theory of ethics, isn't it? And the reason I find it intriguing, and I'll end on this, is because it manages to walk that fine line between, on the one hand, uh, ethical subjectivism, in which an individual says that just whatever I think is right, it's right for me, and to heck with you, because whatever you think is right for you is right for you, and so there's really no conversation that we can have about morality, and on the other hand, a kind of moral utilitarianism, which looks solely at the actions and the consequences which we perform and takes no notice whatsoever of the intentions that lie behind the actions. The first is trapping an individual inside of her own skull, as it were. And the second is ripping uh, any interiority out of moral decision-making and putting it completely in the hands of the statisticians who calculate the uh, numerical value of happiness that our actions might cause or not cause. So I think that Abelard's ethics of intentionality are well worth keeping in mind as we, in the 21st century, strive to be moral agents. I'm Father Kerry Walters. This has been another Holy Spirit Moment. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time.